now with the abundance of uh, DNA sequencing data. So we can read individual human genomes and find specific differences uh, between individuals. Uh, there's a very important question, what variants are actually important and what variants are not important? Uh, because you can make change in DNA even in gene coding for protein and nothing would happen, meaning that molecular function of the protein wouldn't get changed. Uh, there would be no co consequences for this individual. Uh, there would be no evolutionary forces acting, uh, for example, natural selection acting on this variant. This is a problem of um, great practical importance because uh, now you may have individuals uh, with certain condition which is perceived to be genetic and uh, clinical genetic lab may discover specific variant in, in their DNA. Uh, however, nobody observed this variant before. So we have no information on whether this variant is important and causes this condition or this is just spurious variant uh, which uh, has no consequences for molecular function and for uh, is not involved in disease risk. It is important to say uh, or to predict which variants are of, of importance and which are not. Uh, there are some sources of information. One is, of course, segregation in families, uh, where we know that some mutations track in families together with uh, certain conditions or certain diseases or certain traits. Uh, however, this is rarely available. Uh, there are ways to do experiments uh, to study a specific system, uh, for example, in vitro or in a model organism, introduce this mutation and measure consequences. Uh, frequently this is not available, this is a very laborious task. Sometimes non-informative about human conditions, sometimes it is. What we've been trying to develop is a set of methods to computationally predict the outcome uh, with variable degree of success, uh, as well as some others in the field. The idea here is that long-term evolution uh, may help explaining variation in humans now. Uh, currently we have access to genomes of 44 vertebrate species uh, and building a model of evolution at this specific position in DNA, we can ask the question whether this human mutation fits um, uh, this um, pattern, what we observe in long-term evolution. Uh, so changes that are happening between different vertebrate species whether they are predictive or you, you would anticipate this change in, in the human population or you would not anticipate this change. This can be complemented also by looking at, uh, at the level of structure of molecules when they are available. And uh, uh, our colleague John Mould has made this observation that most of changes uh, impact stability rather than specific aspects of function. So uh, if you look at structures and, and if you can compute uh, change in free energy um, for specific proteins, free energy of, uh, of folding, so um, how stable is native conformation of this protein, this can also be informative. There are several um, <coughs> lines of evidence that these methods work in statistical sense. One is we can take very large set of human disease mutation and uh, set of variants which are common in the population and to the best of our knowledge uh, don't do any harm and we can separate them statistically however not very well with accuracy of about 80 percent. We can also look at the population and correlate these functional changes with statistical changes of uh, tests of natural selection and see that these variants are, are primarily under pressure of natural selection. So for example they have an average lower frequency or uh, a smaller proportion of them contribute to differences between say human and chimpanzees versus um, segregate within a uh, human population. Uh, however, uh, one serious problem and this is what hampers our progress is the assumption that every position in, in protein evolves independently. So if we follow evolution of the protein, uh, all other positions are not of importance.
So for example, when I try to uh, make inferences uh, about human mutations from looking at um, what happens in the fish, in, in the crocodile, in the elephant, uh, I assume that what is good for the fish or for the crocodile is the same what, uh, what, what is good for human. And there are two reasons this may not be the case. Uh, one potential reason is uh, that I don't live in the water and my conditions are very different from conditions of fish. Uh, the other reason is that there are many other changes in sequence of the same protein molecule in fish compared to human. And some of those are important for speciation and for differences between the species. We think that we know that this is an important, um, important aspect of the story because for about 8% uh, of mutations which have been annotated as causing disease and knocking down human proteins, we observe this exact amino acid in one of the vertebrate species. Again, there may be potentially multiple explanations. Uh, however, uh, we think that what, what is likely to happen is that there is a different change in the same protein uh, suppressing the effect of, of the human mutation in different species. Of course, this has to be tested experimentally, and we have uh, evolutionary simulations uh, suggesting various scenarios. Um, uh, however, uh, <coughs> the way to go is to move to some experimental system and testing whether this prediction is, is actually correct. One possibility is uh, uh, to look at situation in, in a model organism, for example, in zebrafish. Um, and work of some labs, for, uh, for example, a Nico Katsanis lab at Duke University, uh, do the following experiment. They um, find a gene in zebrafish, in specific uh, model organism being a small fish species, find a gene which what we call orthogonal of, of human genes. So gene which is probably r roughly speaking same gene in fish as in humans. Um, and they can knock down function of this gene and see what happens with the fish. At this point, uh, if something happens with the fish, so they know that this gene is important and they can observe experimentally effect on this gene, uh, they can in, inject human RNA, human mRNA, so human version of this gene. And frequently, what human version of this gene does, it rescues the fish. So human protein works in the fish perfectly okay. Then you can look at individual muta human mutations and see if uh, they also can rescue the fish. So they, um, uh, so they act as working. They result in working human protein or they don't. And interestingly enough, uh, we found examples where a specific protein, uh, when, when its function is being impaired in fish, produces phenotype. Injection of human, of human protein rescues fish phenotype. However, injection of specific human mutation doesn't. But this specific human mutation, this exact amino acid is present in fish. So we know that something else happens exactly in the same protein, uh, which uh, allows this mutation on fish genetic background and doesn't allow it to happen in the human genetic background. We're trying in, in my lab to computationally predict the situation and uh, go ahead with experimental testing. Uh, with some success. Uh, it happens to be uh, fairly hard. Uh, however, uh, we're now in the process of um, demonstrating the uh, effect of this in, in, uh, in vivo. Whether uh, in the future we would be able to build a model uh, which would take this into account and uh, would be much more comprehensive model of protein evolution, uh, this would be uh, very helpful in finding uh, functional uh, effect and functional significance of human mutations uh, and would definitely move the field forward. Uh, however, now we're stuck with a single site, uh, simpler models. Saying that uh, these methods are being applied very widely and um, uh, again, they're not highly accurate, but they are useful in many applications. Uh, for example, when you 
um, compare individuals with, 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 with different phenotypes or individuals with disease with controls and uh, analyze number of mutations in specific gene and uh, you can weight these mutations with uh, potential functional information or when selecting between different candidates uh, for specific Mendelian condition. So this, uh, uh, this relates uh, long-term protein evolution uh, at very long time scales uh, to what actually happening within the population nowadays. If we would have a tool in our hands uh, which would enable discriminating between functional variation, non-functional variation, uh, and by the tool I don't necessarily mean computational prediction tool uh, because maybe the leading um, part should be played by various experimental technologies and high throughput uh, experimentation. But if this tool uh, would be available, uh, this would open perspective to solve several problems. Uh, so first we would know which changes are functional, which changes are non-functional, and differences between, say, humans and chimpanzees or humans and Neanderthals. Uh, those are likely evolutionary significant changes. We would know what changes are significant within human population. Uh, so those changes which uh, are responsible for action of natural selection, but also what are the changes responsible for differences in uh, risk of various diseases. So these methods can assist in finding uh, genes underlying these diseases, but also finding specific allele specific genetic variants um, underlying these diseases. And a uh, more practical note in clinical genetic diagnostics in situations uh, where we're dealing with a variant and we don't know whether this variant carries any risk for the patient or it doesn't, we would be able to uh, tell with greater certainty um, and consult uh, potential treatment and uh, consult family members um, uh, yeah, about potential risk. But it, it's not really very remote future. Uh, if we think about maybe two, three, five, ten years down the road, uh, a lot of people would have their DNA completely sequenced. Uh, and information should be reported based on DNA sequence, not based on specific uh, condition or a following specific patient, but almost for everybody. Um, and it would be of great importance if there is certain genetic risk of certain condition to tell this to patients and doctors with certainty. And we do not have this ability right now. So we can just look at the sequence and uh, sift through very large number of variants.